be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Set and Setting Podcast with Madison Margolin. As a journalist, Madison has spent years exploring the intersection of psychedelics, cannabis, and culture. This podcast brings together thought leaders from today's psychedelic renaissance to talk about the role of psychedelics in our inner and outer lives. You can support this podcast and find additional resources at BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Madison. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Set and Setting podcast. Um, our guest today is Laraji uh, from Harlem, New York. He's a multi-instrumentalist, composer, recording artist, therapeutic laughter teacher, educated in music theory, composition, and piano at Howard University in Washington, D.C. from 1962 to 1966. He performs and records stimulating new music informed by his love of dance movement, trance meditation, visionary sound, and bliss lifestyle. I love that intro. Thank you, Laraji. Thank you, Madison. So um, so let's just start with kind of like who you are, your background. Like how did you get to where you are today, um, you know, as a creative, as a laughter teacher um, and more? So could you kind of explain all of that? Uh, I grew up in the Northeast United States and my family was a... Uh, family and extended family. It was very much into laughter, humor, uh, up-spirited, into dance, um, loved music. I'm the only one that really pursued an extended career in music, um, performance, music study. Uh, the early years, uh, I was exposed to religion through the Baptist church and religion and the images presented in the Bible and in the religion and the preacher's really inspired me. It, it helped me to feel that there was a, definitely there was an invisible force behind this wonderful thing we are calling creation. And it was the, um, I guess, the image of Jesus the Christ at the time that impressed me that here was a cat who was in tight cahoots with the universal creator. And I said, yeah, I want to do that too. So uh, Jesus was my idol at the time and Roy Rogers was second. But I uh, went on through school, high school, thinking I wanted to become an engineer. And at the last minute, I switched to a music uh, interest and attended Howard University for music. Up to that time, I had been, been playing piano, violin, and trombone in the high school orchestras, band, and choir, and in the church choir as well. So music is a very strong area of my life. Into college, Howard University, studying music theory and composition and piano, and on the side doing comedy with various funny people who would team up and do comedy teamwork. And eventually, I got the uh, inspiration to come to New York in 1966 and pursue comedy in the village, thinking that would be a way to get money and I could set myself up in a nice apartment with a grand piano and get back to composing. During that process of uh, acting, I got some roles in uh, television commercials off, off Broadway and some tours. And that period inspired me to want to reach deeper into my spiritual side and understand my spiritual origin before I go any further into the mass media. And that exploration into meditation, Eastern philosophy, and various other internal uh, exercises, I uh, opened up my creative, my create, my musical creativity on a higher, different frequency. I used to think that I, the music that I would create would come from ins outer inspiration. Well, the bigger inspiration came from within myself. Exploring in uh, in the late sixties into the seventies with uh, uh, marijuana, hashish. Uh, dance, meditation, yoga, uh, various forms of uh, alternative healing techniques. My music at the time, in 1974, after a clairaudient experience hearing music of another dimension, 
I was guided to s- trade my uh, guitar for an auto harp in the Queens, New York. And the auto harp turned out to be the instrument I could experiment with to represent the impact of this clear audience experience I had in the 1974. It was an experience I had during the time period I was doing intense long hours of meditation. Sometimes it was assisted with marijuana, cannabis. And uh, the music I heard, well, I'm constantly reminded that it's not proper to talk about this in past tense because the experiences of the uh, eternal present moment. And so that experience opened up my, uh, my quest for a musical form, a musical expression that would embrace the eternal present moment and the unity of the universe. And so this, sound hearing experience presented a model to me of what I would like to do with my music on this side of the veil. So I began exploring this new age sound music with the electric auto harp in the mid seventies. And around the late seventies, I was playing on the sidewalks of Brooklyn and Manhattan, uh, busking. I didn't call it busking at the time, but I was experimenting with performing from meditative states and the impact it would have on uh, the public. And I discovered that the music would relax people, especially at rush hour. They would drop out of their hustle and bustle and really stay tuned into the music. And I would notice that uh, people who would go into trance, the trance would be broken if I did anything like abruptly, like break a string or step out of my own focus. So I recognize the uh, power of being in trance and and holding the body language, holding trance states with music and performance posture. That those years led to my being invited to New Age expos, meditation centers, yoga centers, uh, New Age conferences, and where I began offering things like uh, connecting with the inner healer through music in the early eighties. Uh, festivals and conferences on the East Coast, the Northeast United States, Life Spectrum, um, Spiritual Frontiers, things like that. There were week-long conferences where people would use their vacation times in the summer to investigate alternative forms of consciousness and healings and what have you. And during those conferences, I was exposed to teachers who had who were offering me alternative views and all alternative methods of doing whatever, from uh, curly and photography to uh, Tai Chi Chuan. So my inner journey was thickened by my exposure to teachers that I would meet along those conference circuits in the early 80s. Um, my stand-up comedy career in the uh, 60s and the early 70s came to abrupt close when I began exploring the consciousness, uh, mind science and mindful consciousness, and decided that I wanted to take more responsibility for what I spoke and what I said and what I represented with my behavior. And around 1980, in the circuit with the uh, New Age conferences, in addition to music, I began bringing forth laughter meditation as a therapy and as a workshop so this was a different format than stand-up comedy because here now and i was also doing comedy in a circle format and with people who were in workshops and were interested in consciousness so i was in a setting that was not cigarette or alcohol um, dominant and it was with people who were looking for new inroads to their spiritual center so that uh, period, I developed both musical workshop uh, agendas and laughter workshop agenda. And uh, also during that period, I began doing more music touring with uh, Brian Eno, Opal Limited, a uh, production company out of England, began uh, producing tours around the world and including artists that were on his label, Opal Limited. So I began a touring around the mid 
80s, Europe, uh, Japan, um, Canada. And that opened me up to seeing the people who were listening to my music because my recorded music was out in the world long before I was touring. And I got to hear their reports and responses, things like how my music would uh, bring them in a state of peace or take them out of high anxiety or help them through crisis. And that helped me to take more responsibility for the uh, therapeutic side of my music. Uh, that brings us up to the current day after many recordings. Most of my recordings are done with the intention of of supporting calm, bliss, inner peace, and also to take the edge off of the thing called paranoia that many, uh, that's usually associated with the use of marijuana, cannabis at the time. Music that has a high sense of positivity, luminosity, and to suggest uh, an all-pervading safe space, I call it, so here I am now talking with Madison uh, after many recordings, many concerts. At the present time, I've kind of cooled it on the touring circuit because of the vaccination mandate and some health issues. That the, My touring years was usually touring with lots of baggage. And uh, now uh, I prefer not to put myself through that. I've done it and I've recorded and documented that period. And I've been doing a lot of work online. So that takes the place of lots of extensive touring. Wow. Well, thank you for, for laying that all out. I have so many questions just based on everything you just said. Um, but, you know, one of the things that caught me up, caught my eye uh, when you, when I read your bio initially was uh, sort of this, um, you know, the laughter meditation. So, you know, my question to you is, you know, there were two things that you said was one, you talked about how your music, especially busking during rush hour, kind of dropping into this trance state. And then, you know, a few minutes later, you kind of discussed the laughter meditation. So I'm wondering if there's sort of a relationship between um, laughter and what it can enable and engender within us. And then also like a sort of trance state of mind um, that is also conjured uh, through sort of external um, stimuli. So, yeah, I don't, does that question? Yes, yes. Uh, well, the laughter part, the way that I conduct laughter workshops is to get the participants to go inward. And uh, so it's preparing, same like, like yoga, one could call it laughter yoga. It prepares the nervous system, the breathing, and the body, the muscles to totally relax. And in the workshop, in the laughter workshop, the participants are lying down for the very last part of it, similar to yoga postures. The final posture in a yoga class is Shavasana, if you're aware of it. And that's a place of uh, least resistance to meditation and least resistance to hearing inner sound current, the cosmic sound current. So laughter plays a part in relaxing the nervous system, relaxing the uh, mental space. So allowing the participant to relax into meditation or either go to sleep or just to enjoy deep relaxation. For creativity, laughter has found that uh, my work with laughter expanded my appreciation of what I call the play zone, that the laughter workshops begin with conducting the participants in a playful period to get into playful attitude, spontaneity. And getting good at this means, uh, well, the definition of play that we use in the workshop is play is the spontaneous exploration of sensation. Play is the spontaneous exploration of sensation. And that, that carries over into improvisational music very well, as I find that in music improvisation, uh, we let go and flow and discover and experiment, and we run into things that we didn't know were waiting for us along the musical journey. And the ability to be ready to let go and explore a sensation and play with it and uh, to let it play with us. So the laughter work lends itself to the musical creativity. And the musical creativity... Uh, 
contains more positivity, brightness, playfulness, bounciness, uh, daringness, exploration, the, the courage to explore more in the musical realms as a result of the laughter release work. And the musical realms of uh, uh, my explorations are usually done with recorder. I mean, a, a recorder is going while I'm exploring and I go back and listen and hear things that are relevant to states of consciousness that I'm interested in, whether patterns, drones, uh, different effects, and how they impact me listening sober or listening while I am uh, offering herb up to the great Shiva. The, uh, so I did the study and exploration and experimentation on myself. And also in, in the early <clears throat> 80s, um, I did do a lot of jam sessioning in studios late night with musicians who would chip in to rent a studio early into the hours of the morning. And so there was with uh, psychedelics and music. And there I got to further explore, experiment, and test on myself what works, what helps, what what scatters energy, what helps to contain energy, what helps the uh, uh, other musicians would become inspired to drop into a higher frequency of music, whether soft, spacious, open, gentle, passionate, uh, so I got to observe, experiment on myself and with other musicians who aren't necessarily oriented toward New Age music. And all of those events, it seemed like uh, jam sessions, if you've ever been in them, they're very laughter friendly. So laughter and music has been uh, on my journey uh, up to the present time. I hope that addresses some of your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and another thing you mentioned just now was these jam sessions and sort of like, you know, you're really, you've you've referenced already your relationship to cannabis. Um, but like where, how have entheogens, I'll use the term, you know, cannabis or other psychedelics kind of uh, played a role in your sort of development musically um, and your own spiritual practice? Well, the first time I was aware of cannabis was while watching television um i forgot pre maybe it was college or pre high school or right after high school watching a television show that depicted the east village and these undercover police officers who were going to infiltrate a beatnik uh community and one officer was teaching another officer how to smoke a joint without inhaling it and it was instead of inhaling and blow through it so that the end lights up and watching that scene something inside of me clicked like a voice says hey i'm supposed to explore whatever that's all about I got a very clear signal it wasn't until i got to uh college howard university the one evening uh my roommate was uh in a room with other fellows from new york city and they were just giggling away i had walked into this without knowing what was going on. And uh, they said, do you want to try any of this? And I said, what is it? This is pot. So I took a hit and uh, I experienced nothing. And soon after that hit, they all were giggling at me saying, you're high and don't know it. <laughs> but I didn't know it. It wasn't until um, a year or so later while I was up at uh, a summer job in the Catskill Mountains, I think, doing a summer job and uh, the, the hands or the help were smoking cannabis in their dorms. And I got to experience it then and still I wasn't clear what it was supposed to do. So eventually I moved to New York City and I had some friends who were very much into the cannabis scene and they allowed me to have a nickel bag at the time. And I decided I was going to do 10 experience, ten experiences with this to see what I could find out about it. And if I felt nothing, I was going to drop the whole quest. So it was during that time of exploring that I remember lying on my bed, uh, looking out of a window in Harlem, 
to the next window across the hall, across the car the courtyard. And there were a milk carton and a Tropicana orange carton on their windowsill. And at some point during maybe the third or fourth try at cannabis, I was staring at these two car- cartons and one of them became a penguin and the other one became something else. And they were doing a soft shoe dance. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and so from then on, I found that cannabis opened up the doorways during my meditation experiences. It opened me up into a more subtle realm of the present time. Um, things that were here, but I didn't see. I found that through, through meditation, would relax me and bring me into present time. But the cannabis would sort of be like a warm uh, ceremony or ritual that uh, made things even more present. Uh, I found that I could just jump on the piano after doing some exercises, calisthenics with the, with the instrument, and then just improvise. And the improvisations with uh, uh, cannabis meditation and mindful discipline on cannabis took me into worlds of music that uh, surprised me. Of course, I had the tape recorder on. And it began my new approach to recording and creating music spontaneously with a recording on, format on. In 1974, in the early meditation, I contacted this with cannabis during my intense long hours of meditation. I contacted this other world in music that inspired my uh, sense of the eternal present time and making music that held space for consciousness to hang out in in the here and now. So the Baba Ram Das's quote, be here now, became all the more relevant for me. The, um, I had, in the early er ages of cannabis, I would notice, well, we didn't have access to high quality. And I noticed mouth would get dry and eyes would get pink. But the creative that the impulse was still there. In the later years, I started noticing a higher quality of cannabis becoming available, Sensomia, and uh, just higher strengths. Of, and so I had to ingest less instead of, say, smoking a whole joint. Now it's more edibles and vaping that uh, I've resorted to because the smoking was not... Uh, contributing to care of my voice and other things health-wise. And the cannabis is a, uh, offers an inner, opens, uh, well, I guess, I don't say to uh, the coziness of the here and now becomes more obvious. It changes my, my awareness. The fabric of the universe becomes a more cohesive, all-pervading unified feel <laughs> call it that and if i'm in that synchronicity while doing music i am more likely representing a cohesive feel a unified present time a safe continuity of present time of consciousness and i've noticed by the way that my music attracts listeners and music sells and the concerts that I give, that the uh, impact of music that comes out of this sensibility, that the sensibility of uh, the high state or this deep meditation state or the yogic consciousness state is the kind of music that I appreciate sharing. I mean, I could do jazz rock, I could do R&B, but I don't know if I want to take the responsibility for the kind of lifestyle that would attract around me. This music attracts people who are pretty much open to alternative consciousness, uh, meditation, contemplation, uh, positivity, bliss. So I've made the choice to uh, stay focused inside of this more new age, ambient, healing, positive, musical lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you said that it helps you kind of create music that it in 
helps people get into the here and now. So like what are the hallmarks of something that would assist in allowing people to be more just present and embodied? And A breath for one, a connected breath, a slower breath. So that's some of the elements of conscious musical creativity is to uh, represent a physical organism whose breath is calm and easy. Also, uh, uh, the water body, music that suggests oceanic moods, uh, water, fluidity. Uh, so the idea of movement, dance movement, meditation movement, whether it's mudra or tai chi chuan, that can be represented through musical flow. The, uh, these are the hallmarks. Breathing, slower breathing. Okay, positive mental attitude, whether it's uh, focusing on positive imagery. In my cases, it could be angels, it could be uh, colors, the colors of the Roy G. Biv, the, the rainbow spectrum. Are, uh, in, in my case, I, can, I have used it. I used the ocean as an object to focus on while doing music, also to invent an imaginary person sitting in the middle of the room in the deepest meditation and play for that person mindfully learning how to uh, support that inner journey and how to avoid doing anything to distract from that journey. So it's learning how to sustain holding space for that inner journey. So there's inner stillness, there's breath that can represent inner stillness. There's uh, the f a, a relaxed body. Uh, music can can suggest relaxed body, a loose body, openness, as opposed to rigid and firm and resistant. Uh, a music that represents flow uh, as opposed to resistance. I'm at the present time now where I'm exploring the idea that there's no bad or good, no right or wrong. There's just flow or resistance. You're either in flow or, or in resistance. When I look at that as a model, I stop calling things bad or good or right or wrong. And music can and laughter can open uh, uh, an organism up and a consciousness up and the emotional body up onto the flow, flow state, as you call it and can release someone from resistance. Music also, um, I've done, and I've been told this by uh, energy workers, my music helps to uh, release people from subconscious stress patterns, to dissolve subconscious stress patterns. And I, that invited me to be even more conscious of what I'm doing. The music that helps release someone from subconscious stress patterns helps to release them from congestion, resistance, doubt and confusion, and even trauma. Uh, also, another hallmark is beauty, to represent beauty, balance and beauty. Because my understanding through an ayahuasca journey is that I observe the connection between observing beauty and the heart opening, so that Presenting beautiful imagery in music helps the listener to feel love and to feel uh, included and embraced. I like I like specifically what you said about uh, trauma, and it was you know part of what I was thinking was your music feels like the type of music that one could also listen to if they were um, going on a psychedelic trip or journey or sort of doing yes. trauma work. So is there yeah? Do you want is it, is it have people told you that they're using your music for that? Not only that, they approached me to produce music specifically for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, field trip health is one uh, app that that has two of my uh, hour long compositions in on their apps and uh, some other apps. Calm music mm -hmm. um, for the for the audience app. who doesn't know. So field trip is. Um do you want to explain what the app is? It's like an app that sort of guides people through a psychedelic trip, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the music is specifically for people who are looking to be more mindful in their psychedelic journeys and to have it supported by, in my case, music, mindful music. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And and I, I think that that's why I say I'm happy that this time period, we find that the arts are being welcomed into a more open and conscious rapport with the psychedelic realm, psychedelic use. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, it's funny because in, you know, you talk about trauma therapy, for instance, and I don't know if you're familiar with like EMDR, but no. So it's it's a certain type of therapy where you're listening to different beats and the kind of binaural, like one, uh-huh. you know, like you're wearing headphones and one side beats, the other side beats. And it sort of does this thing where you're oscillating between the sides of the brain and you're, you know, kind of at while you're under these headphones, you're also doing the therapy work. Like you're dropping into certain memories or certain types of consciousness Uh and the music kind of aids on a neurological level while you're doing the psychological work. What, what happens eventually during that session? Um, you know, I've only done it if, you know, I haven't done it that much myself, but I have done the MDR and it, I think it just kind of gets on a passive level. The music helps you get into a, just like a deeper brain state. Uh-huh. I, I, I wish I knew the science behind it and it's something I should really look into. But, you know, I would imagine also when people are doing MDMA therapy or psilocybin therapy or whatever, whether it's for trauma or other, you know, other indications that one would go to psychedelic therapy for, the music, you know, whether that's just is getting you into like a sort of a flow state or more calming space or if it's literally having an effect on your neurological functioning um yeah. you know that's yeah do you remember whether it felt pleasant or were just ordinary experience i mean did it contribute to bliss ecstasy or euphoria um it was more like trance like mhm yeah i don't i mean i wouldn't call it bliss or euphoria but i would say that it was it just gets you it's like, you know, you know, like when you think about like hip, someone's hypnotizing you, right? And you think of the image of the that clock thing that's going yeah. back and forth in front of a person's face. It's like that for your ears. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You just helped me to make a uh, an advanced connection. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> now I got it. Yeah. Because yeah. I use that um, stereo panning in my recordings lately and especially for people who are listening on earphones over here this panning now you helped me to make the connection of how that can contribute to Mm -hmm. uh, binaural Mm -hmm. yeah so um one thing you also mentioned um you know earlier on in your upbringing was kind of connecting to jesus like through through religion and sort of you know so much of the quote-unquote new age is very like I'll say post-organized religion. Um, and I'm not saying that's better for better or for worse, but a lot of people who are involved in the psychedelic space aren't necessarily like always involved in like, um, you know, the religions that they were born into necessarily. And I've been really, a lot of the work that I do has to do with looking at the intersectionality between psychedelics and religion, whether that's Hinduism mm-hmm. or Judaism or whatever. And so, you know, Hearing also, like, I don't know so much about Christianity, but I would be curious if in your experience, you know, of what you felt, of of your experiences of connection through the Christian uh, framework, if there's any sort of intersectionality between that and your more um, psychedelic or, you know, cannabis infused um, experiences of spirituality, you know, mixed maybe even with your music. Uh, I must say that I didn't grow up with and I still don't have any sense of open embrace loving connection with the the Christian community and psychedelics I would say that the more adventurous explorational members of the community who are create critical thinkers are exploring it and uh, as opposed to or I say unlike uh, the Hindu when I was told that the god Shiva and the four arms is a drum, there's fire, there's something else, and in the other hand is a plant, which is ganja, that ganja is being offered as an aid to meditation. 
and uh, I do know that uh, your sadhus and other people in that Indian area are pretty friendly with hashis and cannabis, and it is aligned with meditation and shifting the frequency, though, that one sees more clearly with a present time uh, understanding of things. So meditation is aided and aligned with the use of cannabis in that community called the yogic, the Eastern yoga community. Back to the Christian community, I just don't see it. I see more alcohol is connected with the Christian community here and my experience of alcohol, it doesn't take me quite where uh, the discipline of, of psychedelics takes me. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, I guess my question more is like you were saying, if Jesus is sort of an example of somebody who is close to God, right? Yes. Correct me if I'm mis, you know, <laughs> yep, mischaracterizing know saying, yeah. anything. Um, you know, is that, you know, people talk about using cannabis or ganja to get into sort of Shiva consciousness, right? It's mm -hmm. like a sacrament of kind of, yeah, getting into like a consciousness that elicits Shiva brain state, I guess. So my question is, is like, without necessarily needing, you know, Christianity to hold space for, for uh, psychedelics or cannabis, more like, is there a way that cannabis can help engender Jesus consciousness or something like a consciousness that is of one who is close to, to the divine? I say yes. As my, uh, my quest to understand more of what Jesus's life was about. So to get in step with Jesus. I mean, I, I did the thing. I accepted baptism at the age of 12 because I understand that's where Jesus was. And later on, I found out that he did the mystery school thing in, in Egypt. And so I found myself exploring mystery school and occult-like understanding to get out from under the, uh, the simple just Bible teachings, to explore behind, above, and beyond the Bible, and to get an occult understanding. And I found that that's what eventually prepared me to have an in-depth experience of what I felt Jesus was pointing toward. I remember sitting in my chair doing intense meditations and feeling that I had finally found that space that uh, where the, the mystical sayings of the Bible made sense to me. I and my father are one, the kingdom is close at hand, and so many of the things I was told when I was young I didn't quite understand, but I trusted that they were leading somewhere meaningful. The, the cannabis experience... And the meditation experience eventually dissolves all my questions. I, I believe that uh, I was looking for the wrong answers. Well, no, no. I, I, I was asking the wrong questions. You know, we're looking for something, looking for the light, looking for heaven. And uh, meditation and marijuana shifted my awareness, or psychedelics shifted my awareness, to not look for it, but look as it, that I am it. It's right here inside of me. And the ability to see through an alternative frequency of vision was helped by the use of psychedelics. The Bible are words. They talk about the hereafter. Uh, the Christianity, your mystical Christianity, does hint at an ever-present God uh, but still, reading it on a book still lets one think, ah, oh, it's waiting for me somewhere else, even though they're talking about the here and now. Psychedelics sort of puts the book aside and says, drop into the zone and feel it, be it, uh, wear it, know it. And uh, for some of that period, I felt like I was a, a betrayal, betraying Christian the Christian modality by having a direct experience myself. And so to be around the, uh, um, the Christian community, it's a friendly community. It's a safe community, but yet I feel that I could, uh, 
annoy or uh, what are the other words uh, insult the community if I were to open my my approach to becoming becoming more aware that psychedelics really represents the plant, the kingdom, um, the plant world. And uh, to be prejudiced against the plant world, saying, no, I can get to heaven without the plants. I don't need those things. I say that the plants are here and that there's a certain intelligence that comes to the foreground when I align with it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, you you know, you've mentioned a lot about your relationship to cannabis. Um, what about psychedelics? Like, is there any particular experience you've had or with any particular type of substance that's been formative for you? Um, I haven't really had experience with the other one, just ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. I haven't done, uh, I've heard of peyote, San Pedro, and uh, mescaline cocaine, heroin. I haven't dealt that far. I decided to uh, hold up with the softer version, the ayahuasca and the hashish and shrooms are coming up on board now that uh, I think they, uh, for my lifestyle, I feel maybe less disruptive. Um, when I say less disruptive, I mean, I can function on the, uh, uh, whether I'm uh, on tour or not on tour, whether I'm in a recording studio, I'm familiar with how to navigate with these. I haven't been in a situation where I've uh, done the Don, the Don, the Castaneda spit. If I were to go to South America, maybe I would do, and I just focus on having psychedelic journeys there and I could let go of concerns so just to answer your question, I haven't done the the other palette of psychedelics mm -hmm. enough to talk about them. I'm curious about ketamine. I'm curious about uh, peyote and mescaline. But I haven't been in the right set and setting and opportunities to do them. I hear. Um, you know, my, one of my last questions was, and this is always just so curious to me because I'm interviewing so many people from all different walks of life and industries and so forth. What is your daily practice or weekly spiritual or flow state practice that kind of like enables you to go forth and do what you do in the world? At the present time, it's very spontaneous. It depends on what's going on in my life at any particular time, whether I am have to be up at eight o'clock to conduct a workshop or an interview. And my general preferred flow is to be up all night because during my meditation early meditation years i've learned that three or four o'clock was a mystical time when things start floating through effortlessly and so i like to be up in a creative mode or meditation mode from about 12 into about six or seven in the morning and whether i'm recording or writing uh that's i feel very at home at peace when i'm channeling at, and during those hours, uh, before the day starts, I'll do some yoga stretches. And if I feel I need to sit for an extended period of time, 20 minutes or half an hour in meditation, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll do it on the bus or the train if I have to go somewhere. Vegetarian diet is, is my preferred diet, vegetarian diet. Uh, I prefer to practice nonviolence in the form of the clothes that I wear. I try to wear, try to let my life be a mindful lifestyle where it doesn't represent cruelty or uh, violence to animals. Uh, I try to be mindful of my speech, my inner speech and outer speech. Um, I feel that when we curse, we curse ourselves, but using soft speech inwardly. Also, breath work to now and then slow down and connect my breath and have a breath session of connecting the breath. And, and in the parks of New York, I like to visit and do Tai Chi Chuan, a form of movement with consciousness centered in the Tantian just below the belly button. And that is a very, I drew the word powerful in that it takes me out of the head. And that's where a lot of collisions and anxiety goes on in the head. So when I'm in 
down here in the Tantien, I'm experiencing the vastness of the chi field. I'm experiencing what I call the peace garden, the uh, all-pervading serenity. And when I practice knowing that, the field, it gives me the uh, imagery and the motions I need to go ahead and produce and record music that represents that, music that sounds uh, unreal or otherworldly relative to the world we think we're seeing out here. So the ability to produce and record the serene music, calm music, blissful music, as a result of actually being in a state of awareness where I'm experiencing that through the body, through the breath, and uh, we call it altered states. Altered states of psychedelics does give us suddenly, we're, if we're in the right set and setting, bliss is real, euphoria is real, the unity, uh, the harmony of the universe is real, regardless of what's going on next door or in the next county. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for, for answering that. So last question is, where can people find you online or find, find out more about your work and keep up with what you're doing? Okay, you can go to laraji.blogspot.com. That's one area. L-A-R-A-A-J-I dot blogspot dot com. I, uh, I've been kind of laid back with uh, keeping it updated, but there's lots of information and lots of links that people can go to and, and, and find videos and other interviews I've done. So that's one way of keeping up with me. Mm-hmm. All right. Perfect. Um, well, thank you for joining the podcast today. And I'm excited to kind of hear more about, you know, just see what you're doing in the world. And the um, the church concert sounds really cool. So definitely I'll look into that as well. Thank you, yeah. Madison Margolin. Thank you. Thank you.